grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all of your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all of your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here your, their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful Father, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. We pray the prayer of the day. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in the true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. The first scripture lesson today is written in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. And here Paul talks about the end of the world and says, always be ready because it will come like a thief in the night. And so we need to be awake, we need to be alert, and ready for our work to come. Now brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. This is our first lesson, and let's read responsively Psalm 90. <laughs> Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth of the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Oops. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. <laughs> You have set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. You turn mortals back to dust. We sleep away in the sleep of death. The length of our days is seventy years, or eighty, if we have the strength. We understand, but our one sorrow. Teach us to number our days aright, 
Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. That we may sing your joy and be glad all our days. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let's rise for our gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel this morning is written in the 25th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. You see here Jesus dividing all people like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And then what does he point to as he um, shows what each person has done? While the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink, I was a stranger and you did not invite me in, I needed clothes and you did not clothe me, I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is our gospel lesson. You may be seated. We'll sing our next hymn. Thank you.
mercy, peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, our Judge, Jesus. Amen. The word of God that we look at today is from our Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. This is the word of God. Maybe see it. My friends in Christ, I don't want you to stand up when I say this, because I just asked you to sit down. But whatever you think of when you hear the words, all rise. Maybe you think of church when we're standing up, and sitting down, standing up for prayers or for the reading of the gospel. Although I usually try and say it in a little politer way that all rise. And I said, you may see it as something like that. Please rise. If we hear the words all rise, another thought that may come into our mind is a courtroom. Where the bailiff stands off to the side and just before the judge enters the room, then he says all rise and everyone stands up. Why do we do that? We do that out of respect for the judge. This person is an important person. He or she has to make decisions regarding the case so that justice may be done, and it's a way of showing respect to that person. Now in our text today, we see that moment, a moment of judgment. A court, is, a court case is about to start. Now we don't hear an angel say, all rise, but what we see here is that dramatic moment as the judge is coming into the courtroom. We see that moment as he is about to sit down on his seat at the bench and begin the trial. Now courtrooms here on earth can be very dramatic sometimes, which is why they're often the subject or portrayed in TV shows and movies. But the drama that we may see on TV is nothing compared to what we see here. Because this courtroom and this case and the decision that comes out of this case determines the eternal welfare of every person who ever lived in the history of the world. The outcome of this trial determines where you and I will spend eternity. And so it's a dramatic moment. And we want to take a peek at, at what goes on here as this trial is about to begin. So our theme for today is, here comes the judge. And first of all, we hear all rise as everyone is standing as the judge enters the courtroom. And then it says, the court is seated and the books are open. So let's just kind of work through this, this text here and this part of Daniel's vision. And the first word we hear then is thrones. So we've watched enough Disney movies to know who sits on thrones, right? It's kings and queens, princesses and princes. They sit on the throne because they are the rulers. They are the ones who is going, are going to rule. And they can rule because they have all authority and all power. And so here, the one who sits on this throne is the ruler of all, the one who has all authority and all power, and he is the one then who is going to judge everyone. Now it says in different places in the Bible that the Father has given judgment to the Son. For example, this is from Acts chapter 17. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof to, of this to all men by raising him from the dead. And so that's Jesus, the one he raised from the dead, and the Father will give him judgment. And Jesus actually appears later on in this chapter. But here when it talks about the Ancient of Days, it's referring to God the Father. It says, thrones are set in place. So this is that moment then, as the trial is about to begin. Now in an earthly courtroom, when the trial is about to begin, then anything that has been going on before that stops. All the preparations that the attorneys, the lawyers, have been put in to prepare for this case, that's done now because the case is starting. The defendant, if he's been out on, on bail or if he's waiting in jail, the defendant is brought into the courtroom. 
faces trial. This is the moment of decision. Now when it says thrones are set in place for this world, what does that mean? If we look at this vision and look at the whole chapter, the whole chapter is, is a vision that Daniel saw one night as he was lying in his bed. And it starts out by Daniel seeing four beasts coming up out of the sea. The first one looked like a lion, the second one like a bear, the third one like a leopard, and the fourth one was not like any earthly animal, but was a very fierce, scary looking animal. And Daniel was told that each of these animals symbolizes a kingdom that would rise and then fall, and then the next one would take its place and rise and fall. And he was told then that the first one was the Babylonian Empire, that was the lion. The second one was the Persian Empire. The leopard was the Greek Empire, and the last scary looking beast was the Roman Empire. So each one of them took its place on the world stage, grew to power, and then fell, and then the next one came. And as we have watched history since that time, Till now we see the same thing, right? One nation will get a powerful army, will gain strength, it will acquire a lot of territory, and then it will weaken, and then another nation takes over. And so that's what we've been watching. But now we're at the moment when thrones are set in place. And so this is that exact moment in history when the ancient of days, when God comes and says, okay, we're done here now. Okay, it's time now to end time. It's time to end the history of the world. And whatever people have been doing, whatever nations have been doing, that's all going to end now because now comes a judgment and from here on comes eternity. And so this is where we are. It kind of reminds us of Psalm chapter 2. And there it says, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, so on. So, uh, nations plot, powers do this or that, but the Lord is the one who in the end decides everything. The next words we see then, Ancient of Days. And this is, of course, a phrase that describes God. Calls him the Ancient of Days because he is very ancient and he's seen a lot of days. He's been here from the beginning. He's been here before the beginning because he has no beginning. He is eternal as God. It talks about his clothes being white as snow and his hair being white like wool. And so this is a symbol of his righteousness, his perfection. And when he judges us, then he will judge us perfectly right and just. And then it talks about fire, fire coming out from his throne, flowing out, the wheels being ablaze. Talks, this is a picture of the glory of the Lord. At different times in the Old Testament, the Israelites saw the glory of the Lord. You think of when they left Egypt, and the glory of the Lord was a, a pillar of fire at night, or a pillar of cloud. During the day it would lead them, sometimes it would come around behind them and protect them from enemies behind them. When they got to Mount Sinai, they saw the glory of the Lord and He appeared in, in fire and smoke and thunder and cloud and lightning. Sometimes they would just see the glory of the Lord, this brightness hovering off over there. And so here we see the glory of the Lord as He takes His throne at the end of the world. And then it talks about thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. So, so millions of powers, angels, but all serving Him. And so that shows just how glorious and majestic. This is, this is our judge. He's now coming to sit on his throne. Now what we said about the world is also true about each and every one of us, isn't it? We live our days, day to day. We get up in the morning, we get dressed, we have breakfast, we go to work, or we go to our daily activities, and we come home, we have some supper, maybe watch a little TV or do something, we go to bed, we, we do, we're all over again. We have calendars, and on our calendars we put our appointments for days coming, we, we put our future plans, this is what we would like to do. 
And we may not always say it out loud, but we should always be thinking, God willing. But these are our plans, Lord willing, because the Lord sometimes allows us to carry out our plans, sometimes He helps us to accomplish our plans, sometimes He changes our plans, because He has other plans for us. And whatever it is, we want to pray, Lord, Your will be done. To recognize that what He plans for us is what is best for us. And then the moment is going to come when He comes to us and says, Okay, your work here on earth is done. Now you can come and be with me in heaven. And so we always want to be watching and waiting, as Paul said. Jesus said the same thing too. Always be watching, waiting, guarding our faith, ready for the time when the Lord will come and call us. So the judge has come. It says the court is seated. And then it says the books are open. And so what does that show us? The books are open. What's in those books? Well, it doesn't really say what's in the books, but it implies then that these books are going to help the judge, the Ancient of Days, as he passes judgment on the world. So does that mean that God needs to look it up in the books, that he's kind of clueless or he's going to be flying by the seat of his pants and so then he asks, well, I have to look up and see who this is and who this is and what book they're in. No, it doesn't imply that, but it shows us that God knows everything because of the books. It shows us that God is not going to make judgment based on hearsay or circumstantial evidence or testimony that is biased or slanted or imperfect. But it shows us that God knows everything. He knows everything we've done. He knows everything that's in our hearts. And so when He passes judgment on us, it is going to be perfect and right and just. Now the book of Revelation talks about books also. Chapter 20, toward the end, when it's talking about judgment, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. But later then, if, any was if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So two kinds of books. One, it says, recorded everything we've ever done and judged on everything we've ever done. The other book says it's the book of life. And if our name is in the book of life, then we get to go to heaven. If someone's name is, is blotted out of the book of life, then that person does not get to go to heaven. We may say, well, wait a minute. This is a little confusing. I thought we were saved by grace through faith alone and not judged on everything we've done. How can that be? Because if we're judged on everything we've ever done, then we're going to be in a heap of trouble. Right? But when we have questions like this, we can always look at the rest of the Bible for answers. And as we do that, we see throughout the Bible it very clearly and very consistently says that we are saved by grace through faith, not because of anything that we've done, that we can't boast in our works so they don't count for anything, we're only saved by grace. Our Gospel lesson helps today. Because here Jesus has divided all people. And He points to the believers and He points to the works that they have done and says, this is what you did for me. <coughs> And they're like, well, when did we do that? See, they were not doing it for credit. They were not doing it because they thought it would get them into heaven or get them any closer to God. They were just doing it because they are believers and because they loved Jesus and they wanted to serve Jesus. And they didn't even think about getting credit or being recognized for that. And then he points to the works of the unbelievers. And since they're unbelievers and they don't even believe that Jesus exists, then they're not going to be doing anything for Jesus. They don't even believe in Him. And so, really, Jesus points to the works. He separates us based on our faith and then points to the works of faith that we do out of love for Him. And so when we hear that, we can say, what are we doing? You know, that we are not judged on what we've done. We have faith in Jesus, we know Him as our Savior, we know He died 
for all of our sins. And so we know that when the end of the world comes, we're going to be in heaven. It's a done deal. We know we're going to be with Jesus in all the perfectness and all the glory and all the happiness. We want to be ready, as Jesus says, as Paul said, ready for him to come. And that doesn't mean that we have to fret about doing enough good so we're ready. But the Bible talks about guarding our faith, contending for the faith. And we do that by staying close to Jesus, by feeding our faith with his word and with his body and blood so that our faith will be strong, so that when he comes again, we will be in faith and we'll be ready. You talk about drama in the courtroom. There's a lot of examples of drama in the courtroom. If it's Jack Nicholson yelling at Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. Or if it's that moment when O.J. Simpson tried on the glove and it didn't fit and everyone gasped, it doesn't fit. What's going on here? None of that drama can compare to what we see here in our text, what we see at the end of the world when the Lord comes to judge us. When that happens, we pray, Lord, keep us close to you. Keep us ready. And when that happens, we heed the word of our Savior Jesus, who says to us, when you see these things taking place, look up with joy because you know that your redemption is coming. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Now let's join in confessing our faith. We we'll use the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son has worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Are you see there? No. Stand up. All right. <laughs> we pray. In our prayers this morning, we include a prayer on behalf of Jan Vanderbrink, who took a spill um, a little bit back, and we pray for her. Dear Heavenly Father, who in wisdom decreed that this sin-filled world shall not stand forever, but that swift judgment and destruction shall overtake people when they least expect it, enable us to stand unashamed before you in that day. Nothing that we could do could possibly win your favor, and yet your love found a way, for you sent your only Son to atone for our sins. And dear Holy Spirit, what great joy is ours as we look forward to the blessed day when our Savior and Lord will appear in glory to raise the dead and judge the world. On that day, we shall finally be delivered from this veil of tears. May our joy never diminish and our faith never weaken. As the Spirit of Truth and the Divine Counselor whom Christ promised to His Church, strengthen us during this time of watching and waiting. Praise and honor to you, O Holy Spirit of God. And dear Lord, we, we thank you that you have delivered Jana from serious injury when she fell. We ask that you would continue to bless her healing, relieve her pain, 
and give her strength so that she may once again join us here in church. And Heavenly Father, help us to remember your love and mercy in the Holy Supper that we are about to receive. As we receive the bread and wine, fill us with the joy of believing that we also receive Christ's true body and blood as a pledge of your forgiveness. As we depart in peace from this supper, strengthened in our faith and refreshed in our spirits, help us henceforth to avoid sin in our lives. Rather, give us grace to serve you with total loving obedience as your true loving children. We ask it in our precious Savior's name, and in his name we join in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
welcome. Glad you're here to worship with us today. Especially if you're visiting us, we're especially glad to have you here. Just want to highlight some things. Actually, I was visiting with someone this week, and they have been watching online, and they said maybe you could just hit all of the announcements, just kind of refer to them briefly for the people who are at home and watching online. So um, some extra things and some things that are already in the bulletin here. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Steve Lang and Jessica Niver from Marquette. Um, they were married, actually the wedding was here on Friday, the small private ceremony. Um, church council met this week and the Sunday school teachers met this week and we talked about Christmas Eve. And so, um, sadly, um, we're not going to have our normal Christmas Eve service with all the kids packed up here in front, shoulder to shoulder, and all of us sitting in the pews like this because that just would not go well. So, our plan is to make a video of the kids recording their parts and then we show that. And we're going to plan on having a viewing party on Christmas Eve so you can come here either at 5 o'clock or 7.30 and watch the kids say their parts and sing their songs. And we're also going to post it online so you can watch it there. It's not just going to be restricted to kids though. So if any of you would like to be in the Christmas Eve service and talk about what this verse of the Christmas story means to you or sing a Christmas song up on the screen, let me know by Wednesday night, please, if you would like to be in the video. Maybe we should form a line in the back afterwards <laughs> because it's pretty long and we we'll be up on the big screen. But um, that's the plan. And uh, Christmas Day service will be repeated the Sunday after Christmas, so that will be the same service. New Year's Eve service is on Thursday, so that will also be our Sunday service. Um, same service, Thursday night, Sunday, Christmas Day, and Sunday. Um, so, And that's all on the website. You can look at it there and, and see what's there. Um, Hunter service will be here. Um, that will be our Thursday night service Thanksgiving, 6 o'clock in Marquette, 7 o'clock here on Wednesday night, and then 9.30 here Thursday morning. Um, we are starting to collect for the food pantry, and if you're interested in helping with pajamas or toys, um, you can bring stuff here to church. Dick Ebert from Marquette was in the hospital with double pneumonia this week. He got home midweek, was actually in church this morning, so was doing well. We're thankful for that. Skip Hines from Marquette is fluid on the heart, so that's part of what he's dealing with, and so he's in the hospital to have that relieved. I think that's it then. We want to watch the Wells Connection video. 